Lumi în coliziune Cu Radu Golban La Gold FM Bună ziua, doamnelor și domnilor! Bun venit! la Radio Gold FM, aici live, la emisiunea Lumii în Coliziune pe 96,9 MHz. Puteți urmări această emisiune și pe Facebook sau YouTube. Astăzi vă invit să luați parte la o discuție despre posibilitățile reale ale unei pandemii a zombilor, exact așa cum auziți, dar și despre modalitatea de comunicare pe perioada unei astfel de crize sanitare cu invitații mei. Domnul doctor Steven Schlotzman, profesor la Harvard Medical School și domnul profesor doctor Dumitru Borțun de la SNSPA. Domnul doctor Steven Schlotzman este profesor de psihiatrie la Harvard Medical School și psihiatru la Massachusetts General Hospital. El este autorul cărții The Zombie Autopsies, Notebooks from the Apocalypse. Deci, Autopsia Zombie, apărută în 2011, un roman science fiction, în care a avertizat și despre riscul unei pandemii zombie. De asemenea, acesta a explicat într-o revistă americană, Popular Science, că o pandemie a zombilor se poate produce prin inocularea de prion folosind, în cel puțin la nivel teoretic, un virus care merge direct la creier. În cazul unui virus de un asemenea tip, funcțiile motorii ar rămâne însă intacte. Cei bolnavi ar putea avea forme grave de demență și nu-și mai pot reprima acțiunile violente. Acestea fi cauzate de afectarea lobului frontal, cum ne explică al creierului, precum uh, se întâmplă și în scenariul a romanului său Science Fiction. Pentru bolile provocate, să vă explicăm, de acești prioni, nu există vindecare. Prima epidemie prionică a apărut în 1950 în Papua Noua Guinea, în cadrul tribului Fore. La începutul acești, la început, aceștia tremurau inexplicabil, apoi zbucneau într-un fel de râs de asemenea inexplicabil. Bun. Nu știu dacă o astfel de pandemie la noi ne-ar face să râdem sau ne-ar face, ne-ar face să plângem. Unele genii medicale care ar putea să-și dorească sfârșitul rasei umane, a susținut invitatul meu în 2011, a fi capabile să atașeze prionul unui virus. Ei ar putea folosi un virus care se răspândește repede și care poate duce acești prioni la lobul frontal al creierului. Apoi, în a doua parte a emisiunii, invitatul meu este domnul profesor dr. Dumitru Borțun. El este doctor în filozofie și profesor la Facultatea de Comunicare și Relații Publice a Școlei Naționale de Studii Politice și Administrative din București, la SNSPA, unde predă cursurile Analiza Discursului Public, Teoria ale Limbajului și Responsabilitatea Socială Cooperativă. Haideți să-l ascultăm acum pe domnul profesor Stephen Schlotzman. Hello, Stephen. How are you? Welcome to Radio Gold FM here on 96.9 megahertz on here in Bucharest. Thanks Thank for you. joining us on this beautiful Sunday. How are you doing? I'm good. Thank you very much for having me. It's such an honor uh, to have you here, really. A big, big pleasure for me to talk with the author of the zombie autopsy. A lot of our audience have read this book, and I'd like you to tell us, please, What inspired you to write this novel? Date back 2011. And why do you think it's so relevant still nowadays? Because I uh, think it's very important for nowadays. Uh, well, first of all, thank you so much for your kind words. I I hope it's still relevant. The, the uh, hope of any writer is to write something that even though it might be dated, remains, its central message remains something that we should pay attention to. I, I wrote this book in 2011, uh, actually out of a kind of desperation, not a sad, it was sad at the time. My wife had breast cancer. She's all better now, but at the time it was scary. And yeah, I, yeah. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Um, so I couldn't sleep and I would get my kids to sleep who were then younger, get my wife to sleep. And then I'd go downstairs and watch TV and night of the living dead was off and on, especially around this time of year. 
That's the first zombie, modern zombie film that George Romero made in 1968. And because it's an eminent domain movie, he never got a copyright, it's always on TV because nobody has to pay any royalties to the plant. So I was watching it and I was thinking, I cannot make my wife's cancer better. That's the job of the oncologists. But I could maybe make these zombies better because they're not real. But if you're a doctor like I am, and if you think about the brain a lot, which I do, you could implicate certain ways that somebody could become a zombie. And in doing that, implicate certain ways to stop people from becoming zombies. So I called it the zombie autopsies in part to, to make fun of um, the, the idea that they're the walking dead, because they're not dead. They're still alive. They're sick. So instead of shooting them in the head, which is what happens in all the movies, we would try to make them better. So I wrote this story using the best scientific knowledge I could pull together, made up a disease, and the book did pretty well. It was fun to write. But there are, um, uh, at least in science fiction, there are um, the walking dead zombies, there are the zombies awakening from the dead. There are also in nature cells which behave like a zombie after the death, but I think you rather referred to people who walk like a zombie or behave like the zombie before the death. Is that right? That's correct. Yeah. I So as I thought about this, uh, and, and I want to be clear, I... I reached out. I didn't want to play in somebody else's uh, playground without getting their permission. So I did my very best to get in touch with the creator of the of the genre, uh, George Romero. And he and I became very close friends. And I said, here's my take on it. And he said, yeah, you should run with this. It's not mine. George clearly had them rising from the dead. I'm a medical doctor. I thought I haven't seen anything rise from the dead the way zombies rise from the dead. So I'm going to remove that from the story. What I'm going to do instead is a, is a sleight of hands using language, like a magic trick. I'm going to say, if we call them dead, that gives us a certain right to do things to them that we wouldn't if they were alive. And that's what makes gives people permission to not treat them as if they're alive. And the so shooting them or uh, locking up, locking them away or whatever is like, treating, dealing with someone who is not more alive because he lost his cognitive capacities. He's yes. like almost dead. Almost dead. And, and it exactly. justifies uh, harsh measures to yep. combat or counteract their attack. Which I am not in any way in favor of. So the book was meant to be a little bit of satire. And some people have read it that way, saying that once we make people into something less than people, once we dehumanize them, then we feel that we have permission to do things that we would never do, ever. And that's what happens in zombie films. Such a scenario might also happen in a dictatorship where um, an, author an authoritarian government might deprive people of their rights and treat them like zombies as if they were dead. So it, sh it should not, it, it's not necessary to have a disease. It can also have a sort of political interpretation if I understand it well, what you refer to. Yeah, and in fact, I think historically, more often it has had a political interpretation. Sometimes the dictatorships will, uh, or the totalitarian regimes will label somebody as some, somehow ill or uh, incomplete or malformed, even if they're not, to give permission. I mean, I think the greatest strength of the zombie stories, the reason they've caught on so much is they teach us so much about uh, scenarios like you just described, what happens when we have these totalitarian regimes. From a medical point of view, imagine you had um, a patient in front of you. Which would be the most prevalent or frequent symptoms of a zombie? Uh <laughs> That's a great question. It, it's a fun question because zombies are made up. So I get to kind of spin the answer. Uh, the most, it would have to do, at least in the book I wrote, there would be phases of the infection, just like any other disease where there's a natural history to the disease. So early on, you would see somebody who maybe had a little bit of movement disorder, uh, had maybe used their arms for balance, as you see in the movies, but that's really part of truncal ataxia when you your cerebellum's not working so you can't stand up straight 
as the disease progressed. So we have the walking problems. Yep. What about what? dementia? I mean, it's obvious. I mean, they are not aware. They, they are, yep. They so are conscious, as, but. Yeah, absolutely. As in the beginning, that dementia would be barely detectable. In the same way, it's barely detectable in people with early stages of dementia. You might not know it's there unless you ask the right questions. But as the disease furthers itself, it strikes you right away that there's something not right with this person. They, if you think of the classic zombie scene, they're, they're descending on a house. They want to get in the house. They're hungry. They want to eat, but they can't open the window. They can't even figure out how to open a window. That's fairly progressed dementia. So I wondered what it would be like as people made their way from this very low-level dementia from the beginning of the infection to, and, and I used an infectious etiology for the zombies that I wrote about, to this end stage where they're incredibly demented uh, and also um, incredibly unable to move fluidly and with balance. And uh, the hardest one when you're thinking about contagions is they need to be hungry. If you're going to be consistent with the zombie story, they are hungry. Uh, and, Do we have um, the preclinical symptoms, which some yep. of them are undetectable? Yep. And that's maybe during a time when they are extremely contagious, but unaware of um, the danger for society. And then we have the clinical phase where symptoms are obvious. Is yep. that more or less correct? Absolutely. And the challenge would be a lot of those early preclinical or barely clinical phases would look like a lot of other things. So you'd have to get good at saying, you know what, I, I think this person is in the, the zombie category and, and we wouldn't, zombie wouldn't be a bad thing. It would be a disease. So we'll put them over here. This person is in the flu category. So we'll put them over here. We don't want to treat them the same way because different treatments are indicated. We're not going to kill any of them, but we're going to treat one in different ways. So you'd have to triage better. And that's what the public health officials have noted too. So the triage is essential since there's actually no medicine to, to treat it. The triage is decisive in order to protect uh, uh, the healthy population. Absolutely, absolutely, For, in two ways. One is to prevent uh, treating the healthy population as if they have an incurable disease. And the second way is to protect the healthy population from those who do have the incurable disease from contracting it. So we have actually, in, in, um, we speculate like uh, writing or talking about ideas for a new novel. In the preclinic phase, uh, uh, we have the memory loss, this impaired thinking, the personality changes. Might there also be uh, uh, symptoms like blurred vision or blindness? Or what do you think? Would zombies be blind or, or see so, properly? So this is where we get to have a little fun with the fiction. Um, vision. Well, that's a, also put all about having fun. I mean, first yes. thing you, you wrote me after inviting you, said it's going to be fun. So yeah, here exactly. I'm obliged to, to make sure that we have the fun during the I, And I appreciate that. I'm grateful for it. Uh, so vision, we know, goes through the occipital lobe, the, the back of the brain. All sensory input goes through the thalamus, which is thalamus is Greek for capsule, this kind of capsule-like shaped thing in the midbrain. So unless the whatever was causing the dementia could make its way from the frontal lobe, which we already know is impaired because they can't open those windows, unless it can make its way back to the occipital lobe or down to the thalamus, vision would be impaired. We don't know what their vision would be like because by the time they are presenting to us, unless we've been taking a good history, they're not able to tell us because they would lose their capacity for language. But you can imagine there's still some vision, uh, but not all vision. And then some vision is there so that they can behave like zombies. They can go after food, which is what they're interested in. Mm -hmm. I've seen in a zombie movie that a doctor was screening um, one person's eye to make sure that he's not infected. Uh, so eyes could play a major role in uh, pre-detection sure. of, uh, of a zombie. Yep. That could have to do also with, uh, at least in the zombies I created, the fight or flight response in the amygdala, in the limbic apparatus of the brain, uh, which is, and, and the 
part of the limbic apparatus we're interested in is the amygdala, which is also Greek for almond, because it looks like an almond. There's two amygdalae in either hemisphere. If that's fired up all the time, then your pupils get dilated uh, because you're in that. The more revved up you are and ready for a fight, the more you want to be able to take in your environment as wide as possible. So you can imagine examining the brain, especially with a light, and if it's fired up all the time, your pupils wouldn't contract as much as they normally would when a light was shined into them or shown into them. <laughs> and uh, once uh, the disease enters the clinical phase, then... Uh, let's say aggression, uncontrolled, uh, all sort of uncontrolled um, uh, movement might also be one of uh, the symptoms a zombie might have. Oh, yeah. So for two reasons. One is when you take the frontal lobe out of the picture, you lose your ability to resist the impulse to be aggressive. All humans have aggressive impulses. We, we know that. We see that when we're driving on the highway every day. We see people acting aggressively with their cars. But most of our aggression is pushed back by the activity of the frontal lobe. If that dementia that we've talked about that's associated with the zombie uh, contagion in the movies starts to affect the frontal lobe and take it out of the picture, then those aggressive impulses have more room. They're more primitive. They come from lower parts of the brain. They have more room to express themselves. On top of that, uh, the classic zombie in the movies is hungry, really hungry. And if you're really hungry, you're going to look for your prey to eat. And that's going to make you aggressive. So you have two things driving you, a lack of a frontal lobe that leads to increased aggression that might not otherwise be expressed, and a desire to eat even when you're full because you've lost the ability to know when you're full, when you should stop. Is it just hunger or, uh, or also thirst? Sorry for interrupting you. Oh, well, no, when no, it's you not. refer to hunger, it, it means also water, thirst as well. It can mean both. So um, yeah. satiety in terms of the gut is primarily hunger, primarily food, although there's liquid in food and we absorb a fair amount of okay. water through our gut. But also there are different mechanisms uh, that help us to know when we uh, have drank enough or when we've drank too much. Water, I mean, I'm not talking about alcohol, but just water. We drink too much water, we can get into trouble too. Both of those could be affected by this contagion. And why do you think um, could priant as a priant as a toxic agent be the reason or the cause for such a pathogenicity of a disease? Uh, so that that's a the reason I'm pausing here is. Prions terrify me. They have always terrified me. Ever since I learned about prions in medical school, they terrified me. It, it's a simple word. It's it's a combination of two words, protein and infection or proteinaceous infection. They're just proteins. They're not even alive. They don't have nucleic acid. They don't have DNA. They don't have RNA. They're in all of our brains. They're in your brain right now. They're in my brain right now. They're kept in a non-pathologic state. They're constantly trying to make their way to the pathologic state, and our brain stops that from happening. It's not clear what their function is in our brain, and yet we know that if something tips the balance towards that pathologic state, it's essentially an incurable, dementing disease. It's a horrific disease. So it's a disease we don't understand well, and it's a disease caused by a contagion that happens not to be alive, but it's made of organic material. And it's a disease that is not aerosolized, which allows us to avoid it at pandemic levels. But if it were aerosolized, as I tried to do in the book I wrote, it would be um, very, very difficult to stop. Well, I read that under some circumstances, it can be also aerosolized. Uh, particularly um, dealing with uh, prion disease. There's no autopsy permitted for prion disease because opening the skull would um, uh, uh, proliferate the prions in the air. And also uh, the dental treatment um, uh, protocols are very strict with prion disease because um, um, working in the teeth can also lead to a high proliferation of prions, even... Yep. Uh, um, and in certain, um, any surgery in the gun could also proliferate primes. Yep. 
No, they, so the, I misspoke when I said they can't be aerosolized. They can't be aerosolized at long distances by, by any mechanism that's natural at this point. There's been attempts that you've sent me literature about and that I knew about ahead of time too, to create prions as aerosolized um, agents. Uh, one actually came from Switzerland. Uh, I remember reading a, a piece, uh, an article from Swiss scientists who had done this. Again, it was hard to get the prion to travel far enough but once it did, it infected the, um, I think they were using rats in that study, fatally infected the rats in that study. So if there could be a way to make the prions not just aerosolized, but transmittable in an aerosolized fashion, fashion from person to person, then we're talking a pretty scary scenario. Like having a virus transporting them. Like I said, you set me up, I set you up, like, like in the book. Yeah. So in the novel I wrote, uh, I thought, okay, what's a, what's a, this was well before the current pandemic, which is really, really difficult, uh, you know, obviously for the whole world to deal with. But well before that uh, current pandemic took, started taking place, I thought, what's the most common aerosolized disease that's always around that causes a fair amount of distress, but that we seem to get through, and that would be influenza. And then I talked with some of my friends in molecular biology, because that's not an area that I'm a particular expert in. And I said, would there be room in an influenza virus to hide a prion, which I know sounds silly, but to like put it in the tail of the inf influenza uh, viruses can be um, uh, either cubicle in shape or, or round in shape. Would there be a place that you could put a prion so that when people coughed and the influenza virus went into somebody else would also transmit the prion. And have you ever, um, sorry for interrupting you, have no. you ever uh, given a thought that maybe one day people will not consider your book a novel anymore? <laughs> <laughs> um, I sure hope that never happens. I don't want I hope it to so happen. too. Huh? I, yeah, hope, um, I hope it will stay in the category of, of, uh, of a science fiction but, book, but really. I'll, I'll tell you something interesting. Uh, so George Romero, who I uh, mentioned earlier, he optioned my book for film, and he and I had the pleasure of writing the screenplay together. And in that screenplay, which was back in 2016 when we wrote it, he had people getting into fistfights on planes because they didn't want to wear a mask. So he he saw the very things we're seeing right now and came from my book. So I must have seen it too and just not known it. We, we humans get ourselves into these problems all the time. Uh, and I sure hope the book, instead of being seen as nonfiction, can serve as a cautionary tale. That's would be my, my wish. Yeah, uh, Professor James Giordano, he's a neurologist at uh, the James, uh, Georgetown University, and he's also working for the DARPA. He published three uh, very interesting articles, 2019, about uh, the risk or danger of synthetic prions. And he, uh, he said that a possibility of a non-kinetic, <clears throat> sorry, of a non-kinetic war would be having prions transported uh, by, a, by a virus like influenza, he said. Um, fun enough, he also referred that uh, such a scenario in which prion-based agents were used to impact targeted markets or widespread animal resources could prompt public fears and severe and serve to disrupt specific regional or global markets to incur disruptive effects in international or inter-industrial competition or adversarial engagement. Well, that's, I quoted out of an article he wrote he wrote three articles about uh, possible of uh, possibility of a prion disease 2019 that's an article from the 9th of may 2019 so and that's i mean he's working for dapa that's that's not a sci uh, science fiction novel at the end at the bottom of the article it says that it reflects only his opinion but nevertheless uh, uh, this publication is not one associated with um, science fiction Correct. No, but tell me if uh, we go back for a few minutes, if you don't mind, uh, treating your zombie patient. Tell me, would you disinfect your hands with alcohol or rather use um, lots of soap 
and uh, try to increase the pH level in order to combat the prions. So what would you? Both really. Both. Is, so the other idea I played with here, if it's in an influenza virus, and if that's the that's the vector of transmission, you you can't wash your hands well to get rid of prions in the same way that you could wash your hands well, whether it's soap or alcohol, to get rid of influenza. So if you don't want the influenza on your hands, you wash your hands. That's sort of basic uh, germ hygiene as you go from person to person. We know that well during our current pandemic right now. The pH question was, was again, more speculative fiction, but consistent with the science. We know that prions become more deadly in acidic environments. Some of the theories of the reasons we've had these increases in mad cow disease uh, or, or uh, some of the illnesses we've seen in wild animals, deer, elk, things like that, have been because of increased acidity in the soil, uh, probably from environmental toxins. These are theories. I want to stress that. But we know that prions in acidic environments tend to go from the alpha helical shape, where they're not harmful, into these beta sheaths. These are just the terms they use where they are harmful. So I thought if we all had prions in us that were doing their best to go from the alpha helical shape to the beta sheath, how could we interrupt that? Well, what one thing we could do would be to increase our pH or decrease our internal acidity, create a metabolic alkalosis or in a metabolic state where our pH goes up. And then the trick there the problem there is that the higher your pH goes up above normal for humans, the more you start to look like a zombie. So the dilemma is the treatment starts to look like the disease. Uh, and that was what I wanted to set up. Like, then how do you know whether you're getting sick from the disease or how do you know you're getting sick from the cure for the disease? And everyone has to balance this. The whole world has to as they try to make it better. So increasing the pH um, level too high might make a, that's a human being look like as if he contracted a prion disease. That, is that right? Absolutely. Yeah, you would have myoclonic movements like that, just kind of jerky mo movements. You would have decreased balance and you would have confusion. Same thing you get with prion disease. And why is that so, if I may ask? Um, so... For increased pH, it has to do with the amount of um, uh, ions that cross in and out of uh, neurons so that oh. you can have firing of neurons. With prions, it, uh, I think the etiology is unclear. Um, we know from pathologic specimens, etiology meaning the cause, we, we know from pathologic specimens, if you look at the brain of somebody who's had a prion-related disease like Creutzfeldt-Jakob, it's, it doesn't take a pathologist to notice that it's not right. It's, there are holes in the brain, literally. It's called a spongiform encephalopathy, meaning that the brain looks like a sponge with big holes in it. And the spaces in between the um, gyrations of the brain are much wider. There's less neuronal material. And tell me, please, if a zombie is finally dead, how would you bury him? Would you have to, can you just bury him simply like that? If so, you go on with our speculation or would I have to put him in, uh, in plastic bags? Yeah, or? you'd have to do something like you just said, it would have to be hermetically sealed, which is also problematic from an environmental standpoint. And the reason for that is prions, remember they're not alive. So they're very difficult to denature. You would, the only way you can make a protein not be a protein is to take that protein apart by denaturing it. Prions tend not to denature when you boil them. Like, so you can't get rid of them if you're cooking. They tend not to denature in intense cold. You can, you can, all you can do is isolate them. And the only way to isolate them so that they can't get out would be to hermetically seal the body. You can't allow decomposition because if you allow decomposition, you allow whatever's decomposing the body to spread the prions outside the body. And uh, cremation, is that also a way to do away with the with the prions? I mean, the a crematorium would reach very high temperatures. Would that uh, help to destroy the prions? Yeah, so I would hope so, and I don't know the exact answer to this. I know that extreme, extreme heat can heat. destroy prions, um, but 
I don't know that it's, I, I would need to go back and research that. It's, it's a cool question. I didn't even think about it in the book. I don't know that we could consistently count on cremation to destroy the prions if there's a very high quotient of prions in the now deceased person. Um, the cow is suffering of uh, the mad cow disease. Um, prions survived even five years after yep. they got buried. So just burying a, a, a corpse does not do away with the prions. Right. And you even used not quite the right word. You said survived. They're not alive. So yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, they were still there. They so, are there. Right. So what's fascinating about prions is are you still there? We seem to have a tech. I can't hear you anymore. I think you unplugged your microphone. Uh, we can't hear you. Try again. Maybe. I hope it's not a zombie attack. I can't hear you. You have to close and re-enter, please. You have to close and re-enter. Mă scuzați, a apărut o problemă tehnică. Nu este definitiv un atac de zombie. Îl așteptăm pe domnul profesor Schlotzman să intre încă o dată din backstage. I wonder why it's not working now. No, that's working. I'm backstage. Okay. That's fine. Okay. No, I I'm can so hear sorry. you. I, I can see you, sir. No, no worries. We, we saw that it was not a zombie attack. That was obvious. It was a simple technical problem. I'm can you sorry, hear me? That broke no. up. I couldn't oh, hear you. No, fine. Now perfect. Yeah. Good. You you okay. corrected me and said that they are still alive. You said that they, since they have no life, they cannot be dead. And then it interrupted. Right. Right. I was pointing out that the prions also came to mind because they seem like the molecular version of zombies. They're the undead. They can still do damage. They're made of organic material, but they're not living. At least not the way we've defined anything that's alive. Is there something positive about, about prions? I mean, would life, uh, would our discussion be possible if we had no prions in our brain? Maybe not. So let's look at the positive side of prions. Nobody knows. Are they yeah, so for my understanding, for again, memory? Might, they nobody knows. Um, it, there's there are there's speculation about it, but mm -hmm. one of the interesting things about prions, another scary thing about it is, we we don't have an evolutionary way to explain the presence of something that could so quickly go awry to make us ill in an incurable way. When that happens, usually we start looking for an evolutionary explanation. We'll say, okay, there must be something this does that made it so important that we didn't select against it through, through evolution. We didn't say, this thing's so bad that anybody who has it will increasingly fail to reproduce. And we, we don't see that in at least in a proof-like way. But there are, there's lots of speculation that prions are involved in things like memory or in other cognitive activities that are absolutely necessary for our survival. But then why did the research go that far um, by creating synthetic prions if we still don't know what is the role of the natural uh, unfolded prions, this so-called PRPC? So why then the necessity for artificial prions? Yeah. Um I think it's, sorry, this thing just got a little messed up. Uh, can you see me okay now? I can see you, yeah. It's fine. So the synthetic, this is the cynic in me, became interesting for two reasons. One is just because we can. Like now that we can create proteins so quickly, we Let's have devices synthetic. that allow us to okay. 
<laughs> yeah, let's see if we can. And then even more cynical, as you pointed out earlier, they'd make a heck of a weapon so we could use them. But I read that uh, synthetic prions might be useful in uh, identifying a therapy against Alzheimer. I don't know what is yeah. the incidence of Alzheimer, let's say above the age of uh, 70. And if the billions invested in the Alzheimer disease justify, I mean, we have so many diseases, and uh, I do not want to discriminate people suffering of Alzheimer. It is a widely spread disease uh, for elderly people, but it seems to me that billions were invested in that area of research. And like Giordano said, unfortunately, it was not under uh, the incidence of uh, the treaty against proliferation of bioweapons, even though the, their object of research has a dual use, a therapeut therapeutical use, but also a weaponizable use. So I don't know if the, if the research was aimed at therapy or rather aimed at weapons. Very cool question. Um, oftentimes, as we know from history, the research comes from both, right? That what we learn to be a weapon has a therapeutic aspect and what we learn has a therapeutic aspect can be weaponized. So, you know, if, if we're talking pure science, my friends who are pure scientists would say, I'm not interested in what you can do with it. I'm more interested in whether I can do it. And then it's up to the applied scientist to figure out what you do with it. I'm not sure I buy that. I think there's a there's a certain responsibility we have to do our very best to speculate where our work can go. I'm not a scientist. I, I think scientifically, but I'm a physician. We're not really scientists. So I I would argue that you know, we know that plions are associated. When you look at somebody with Creutzfeldt-Jakob's disease, they have amyloid plaques. They have amyloid changes in their brain. That's awfully similar to the changes that, or it's exactly similar to the changes you see in the brains of people with Alzheimer's. Perhaps, as you point out, creating synthetic prions would help us to better understand the possibility of um, how these amyloid plaques form and how to prevent them. But also, as you point out, we have an obligation as a species to think about the downstream risks involved with creating something so potentially dangerous, even if it's in the name of something so potentially helpful. Doesn't mean we shouldn't do it, but we should think about it. How could such a prion pandemic look like if we were to go on with our speculations? In case you would not have just one patient suffering so of uh, if, a zombie disease, and but many patients, would that be a terrific pandemic or something easily to be kept under control? Uh, in my view, in, the in your view, risk yeah. of a prion epidemic would be. And how would it, those how of would us, it look like? Yeah, would, I'm losing you a little bit here. I'm so sorry. The, it's cracking up. Um, I think you just said in my book. Did you say that? Uh, in such a book, in a, in theory, if we were to speculate yeah. now again, yeah, would you have one patient, ten patients, or would that be a severe pandemic affecting uh, millions? A pre a prion if pandemic pre scenario. Yeah, if the prions are aerosolized, yeah. then you could potentially affect millions. The trick would be early recognition. Because if you had early recognition, you could separate the people with prion disease from the population and prevent it from being, from being spread. I mean, if, you, if we take a step back and look at zombie films, zombies are easy to get away from. I'm talking the slow moving zombies. All you have to do is walk slightly faster than them to get away. It's not hard. All you have to do is put a fence around them and you're done. And then you can start to treat them and make them better. It's the way the non-infected people respond to fear, where they start fighting with one another, uh, because fear makes us into things that we never look better after, I think. So the risk of a zombie pandemic wouldn't just be the millions of people infected. It would be the way those of us who are infected, who are not infected, would respond to one another. Uh, we, I, don't, I would hope we would work together I think we've learned that uh, we don't always do what we should do. 
that would be like a similar scenario to compare it, let's say, with a little fire in a full stadium. The people, instead of uh, being very precautious and extinguish the fire, they will start to flee from that fire. And maybe by fleeing, more of them would suffer injuries than of the, the injuries of the initial fire. Is that something to, is this comparison correct? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I don't know if you've read Dune before, one of my favorite science fiction books. They have that phrase, fear is the mind killer. When you get afraid, as would make sense, I would be afraid if there were a fire in a movie theater. But when you get afraid, you actually put yourself at greater risk because you're no longer thinking with your frontal lobe. You're thinking you become the zombie without having the zombie bug. That's the irony. Um, I could give you a figure how many people could um, die in a prion pandemic. There's a Swedish professor, um, uh, Per Hammerström, and he wrote 2014 um, a study published in uh, Prion magazine and um, what the prof uh, it's called, is the prevalent human prion protein 129 MV mutation a living fossil of paleolithic panzotic superprion pandemic. And he's asking himself if maybe during the Paleolithic age, we might have had already a superprion disease. And he says that, he says that it has a capacity for hyperlethality. He defined it as a mortality rates in the range of 50 to 75% which is a lot of the population of these days, if such a, a scenario might have happened the way he believes. And he's a professor at the IMF Department of Chemistry at the Linköping University in Sweden. That's a very so scary like a number. It's a very um, scary I, number. I, I, yeah. You, um, you see, science you could be more article, scary than I, uh, a novel. So you thought that you make me scary with a novel. Now I make you scary with the science. No, you. The other way, look, right, when, other you, way when you. <laughs> yes, when when you contacted me and and uh, you know asked me to be on this show, I said sure. And then you started sending me these articles that scared the heck out of me because <laughs> the numbers, like the number you just stated, are really terrifying. No, I want to be clear because I don't want anybody to panic and I don't want to panic myself. Me neither. Me We're neither. still in the speculative world when we think about that. Absolutely. But these theories help us to understand a protein that doesn't make a lot of sense otherwise. But you, say, you said something before that we know so little about prions. We don't know what is the use I'm of sorry, the prions. I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? I said, you know, you said before that we know so little about prions. Correct. We don't know why they're there. We, yeah. we, have, we have ideas, theories, but we don't know for sure. Well, that's fascinating. Um, per Hammerström yeah. even said that they were important for the evolution that uh, this prion, super prion pandemic during the Paleolithic age had led to a certain mutation which is still favorable for our, for our health. He says that it created the heterozygotic population which has a certain immunity against the old type of Kreutzfeldt Jakob disease. Um, this related to the keyword polymorphism and 129 and panzonotic um, prionic disease. So apparently this uh, genetic uh, mutation is very relevant still nowadays. And he says this was an evolutionary process after the super prion had well basically eliminated large numbers of the population someday between 10,000 years to 6 million years ago. It keeps, it keeps doing that to me. I don't know why. Someone's interfering. Oh, well, someone is interfering. I, I Can you hear me now? You, you, you got scared because of all the of all our debates, and that was one of the reasons you might have shut off the camera. No, but um, no, 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 no. I. 
Last week I had a debate from Tunisia. Um, the quality of the internet was uh, was very poor, but um, this one are from America. It must be the zombies disturbing it because America is said to have a very performant internet system. I don't know I what's the reason it for is that. Very possible. Well, I was going to say I think it's very possible. You and the rest of the world, including many of my fellow citizens, have an overinflated view of the capacities of America, which I think we've seen over and over. Uh, I don't know what's going on. The technology is not worked all day at the hospital either. As long as we do not talk about um, politics so and about the, the American democracy is fine, but right. um, a colleague of mine, actually two colleagues of mine, one is a moderator, he's a uh, famous moderator is also the father of the owner of the TV station, had an interview with Mr. Severin, a former Minister of Foreign Affairs, Romanian, and they spoke about the American democracy. And uh, I cannot say what they said, because I cannot uh, judge it if that was correct or if that was wrong, but they received a summon from the media authority because Radu, they... I I'm so sorry, I can't hear you. It's Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Foarte trist, pe cum ați observat săptămâna trecută, conexiunea din Tunisia a fost chiar mai bună decât una din America, dar nu discutăm despre calitatea conexiunii telefonice și a internetului în America, pentru că nu dorim ca cine au să ne trimită în consomație. Um, de aceea sunt fericit că domnul profesor Schlotzman nu a comentat democrația în America. Nu știu dacă și dânsul ar putea să primească o somație de la CNA. Is this any better? This is perfect. What I said before is luckily you don't say anything about the American democracy because our media authority had summoned one of my colleagues, a, a moderator, and I guess for having uh, made some uh, comments about the uh, democracy in America, and the media authorities said they censored. Uh, that's a sort of censorship. They oh. said that it's not correct to say anything about democracy. They said something like uh, America is not more a democracy as it used to be years ago, something like that. But I'm, I'm, I'm very prudent because uh, they are with their eyes on such talk shows. So yeah. please, you can you can say you can criticize the internet, but please don't criticize your democracy because otherwise they might even summon you. Oh, I, I that sounds very undemocratic. But yes, I will I will not do that. I don't know if uh, zombies would um, like to have a democratic system. If there is any democratic order anymore <laughs> that zombies or not more. So this is, and I'm serious right now. This is where zombies stories become so fun because they can be used in so many different venues. One of my favorite short zombie films is about um, voting. And it's about uh, people coming back from war who rise from the dead in order to vote. That's all they want to do is vote. And at first, the leader of this nation that they're fighting for decides, well, of course, they're going to vote for me because they were fighting for me. But then he realizes, because he's a corrupt leader, that they're voting for the other side. So he makes a law that says dead people can't vote. Um, and then the other zombies call for reinforcements and all of the dead soldiers who've now become zombies rise up and rise up against this dictator and take him down. Um, so you can, you can oh, use that's these- an interesting aspect. Right, you can use these stories to, to, like the trope to tell all sorts of political stories, but I will shy away from politics. Um, but I will not hesitate to criticize the internet because after two years of a pandemic, I'm really tired of the internet. So. Um, if you were to rewrite or write again a novel about zombies, um, would you this time look at new aspects, let's say at synthetic primes or at nanotechnology, which might also behave like, uh, like, uh, synth like synthetic primes, I had last week in my talk show, Mr. Professor Abdel Melik. He's a Tunisian physiologist from the University of Carthage. And um, he's doing this research now for 20 years, how electromagnetic waves might influence nanoparticles and have them behaving like 
the folded prions mm -hmm. inducing uh, transmissible disease. So then I thought, hmm, next week I'll have um, Mr. Professor Dr. Stephen Schlotzmann. Hmm. I'll ask him if technology would uh, make a more sophisticated prion, uh, sorry, zombie than 10 years ago. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you think of what um, nanotechnology can do right now, um, it can behave. It can behave exactly as a disease behaves, but more so. In other words, the no matter what the environmental conditions are that might either increase or decrease spread, you could adjust for that if you have control over the nanotechnology. So the I read that article that you sent me about that again. Very scary because as we think. Nanotechnology is an amazing thing. It, it has done incredible things, but like all things in science, it also has the capacity to do some pretty frightening things. And if we were taught, if I were going to write this again, I would definitely include outside of the biological realm, a technological realm uh, that would uh, be both our best way out of this mess and also the thing that would cause the problems. Mm. But what I think is very important now, irrespective of a pandemic situation, um, of the uh, infectious agent, it's important to stay calm, actually, uh, not to give way to any uh, uh, tribalism, is to respect the laws, is to respect the rules. That's actually safer than the danger arising from the infected, whatever they may whatever or whoever they may be like. Is that correct? Absolutely. If you watch any zombie film, watch Dawn of the Dead, Night of the Living Dead, um, Fulci's movies in Italy, if you watch any of them, it's not about the zombies. Zombies are actually kind of boring. They just walk around bumping into each other. It's about the human or the non-zombies who and how they respond. We retreat to the very things that we shouldn't. We become more racist rather than less. We need each other more. You need the people who aren't infected to help you. But if they're not in your tribe, you shut them on the outside. You pull up the castle door and you say, you can't come in. That's the risk. But there are also very tragic and sad scenes where you might leave apart because of a triage, a family member, your wife, your children or whoever because you might be infected and they aren't. So uh, very sad scenes where uh, families get split away just because of a potential infection. And then one of the partner would still give a kiss to his partner to say bye-bye and the, the virus or the prion spreads again. You see it all the time. I had it in the book I wrote. You see it in all the movies. I think that speaks to two things. One is um, the human desire for connection, especially with the ones we love and how that can make us, uh, not make us, but lend, lead us to take risks that we would never otherwise take. And then also um, the human uh, capacity for hope. Everyone who's infected with a zombie bug doesn't turn immediately into a zombie, at least in the book I wrote and in the classic zombie films. And they never say once they're infected, shoot me now. They always say, when I turn, shoot me. And I think they mm -hmm. do that because it's their hope that they'll be the one person who doesn't change, that they'll get to stay with their family. And they're even willing to put their family at a little bit more risk by saying, let me be with you until it's the very last second. And, and then, then give me the... Hmm. Tell me, um, would it be wise or um, prudent to keep dis distance uh, during a prionic pandemic, let's say to keep a certain distance, let's say two, three meters from other human beings in case that it would be uh, prions spread by a airborne virus. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. In the same way that it's wise to keep distance for, you know, any infectious disease that has an aerosolized version to it. Uh, the further you are, the less likely the disease is to make its way as a vector into the part of you that it infects. So keep distance, yeah. Yeah. And would it make a difference in a prion pandemic if a zombie uh, scenario would be the real threat to have rules making a difference between uh, the permission to leave the house during daylight or uh, at nighttime? 
It, it would. So this would be assuming that the pandemic caused by the prions leads to photophobia, leads to um, fear of, or not fear, but pain and therefore fear from light. So there would be two things that would happen. One is that it would be safer to go out during the day because the bright sunlight would keep the people who are infected at bay. And two, if you did go out at night, it would. these are very simple solutions. You would carry a very bright light with you because you could shine that bright light and then you would create more photophobia and things would back away. That's it. Now I understand why it's very wise to have a, to have a torch with you. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And part of that's filmmaking, right? Like a torch is a lot more dramatic than a flashlight. I asked George about that. Like, why are they using a torch? They have a flashlight in the house. And he's like, because torches make great movie scenes. But it's the fire, the light itself. It's not, I don't even think it's the heat. It's the light that, uh, and, and photophobia. Pain. Sense. And if we want to really get technical, the photophobia would make sense because of the uh, limbic apparatus firing so much. So the pupils would be dilated and dilated pupils have a very hard time with bright light. Your pupils want to constrict, but if they can't constrict because you're in a constant fight or flight state, then you're going to close your eyes or back away, try to avoid it. Stephen, unfortunately, we came um, to the end of this fascinating debate um, about prions, about zombies, about pandemic situation. In the second part of um, uh, this talk show, uh, Mr. Professor Dumitru Botsun is a Romanian communication specialist from CNSPA, which is the public uh, school for communication and public administration, the faculty. We, and with him, I will talk about ways to communicate in public a prion pandemic or a zombie pandemic. He's a very famous Romanian expert on communication because was a friend of mine, we've been knowing each other for like 16 years. I asked him, how would you communicate if the government would ask you, listen, we're facing a prion pandemic. How would you communicate it? Would you say it's a neurodegenerative pandemic situation, ladies and gentlemen, we are facing, or would you adopt for a more prudent version and say, well, it's something else you are facing nowadays, folks? I would, familiarity leads to greater acceptance and comprehension. So if you say neurodegenerative, then you're forced to define neurodegenerative, which is not an easy term to define. So I would say there is a disease out there that leads to confusion and can affect the brain. And it looks as if its rates of infection are growing. And here's what we can do to keep it under control. I'd, I'd want to, as a psychiatrist, I'm constantly breaking terms down anyhow so that people, we can communicate better. And I'm sure, I, I hope that there'll I'll be a that in mind. the translation of what your friend says, um, because I'd love to see it, uh, see how he responds. I'll do so. I'll do so. Stephen, thank you very, very much. Have oh, a nice Sunday. Thank you. You too. It's and, been my pleasure. And keep in touch. Yeah, I will. All yeah. the best. Thanks okay. for joining us. Sure. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Yeah, Domnilor și domnilor, l-ați ascultat pe domnul profesor Stephen Schlotzmann de la Harvard Medical School, autorul celebrului roman science fiction, Zombie Autopsy. Luăm o scurtă pauză muzicală, iar după aceea, împreună cu domnul profesor dr. Dumitru Borțun, vom discuta despre modele de comunicare în timpul unei pandemii zombie. Lumi în coliziune cu Radu Golban. La Gold FM